You're listening to the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up Podcast, presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle and 24-7 Sports, powered by Overtime Media. I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me, as always, is my partner in crime. You know him as your Denver Broncos reporter for 24-7 Sports. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, we're on, we're recording this the day before the Denver Broncos return and report for voluntary OTAs. And, uh, you know, kind of feels like football's back a little bit. It does, a little bit. You know, for the first time, we're going to see the 2019 Broncos in the same building, Vic Fangio and all the new players they brought in. And um, it's it's an exciting thing to start this new culture, Chad, and this new culture change. And I think Fangio has done well so far, and and Elway has done well buying the groceries. But now it all has to come together on the field. They all have to bond, form that chemistry. And it does start tomorrow with the uh, the phase one of the program, which is limited to weight, weight training and strength and conditioning. Right. And also classroom, because even Todd Davis, he was quoted, uh, I think, over the weekend as saying something to the effect, I'll paraphrase him, that he's really excited to get back and, you know, mesh with the new coaches and learn the new system. Because here we go again, the Denver Broncos are learning new offensive system, a new defensive system. So there's going to be some some opportunities for Fangio to do what he loves to do, and that is teach. Right. That's he, that's the, his number one passion in life, and in football especially, is teaching. That's why he wants to be the defensive play caller for the Broncos. That's why he wants to help coach the outside linebackers. He loves teaching, and this is his this is his wheelhouse right now. He's going to love it, and it's only going to make the Broncos better. So, Chad, you and I have been fiending for Broncos news, and we're going to get some this week uh, starting tomorrow. We do have a lot to get to today. It's going to be a great show, but really quick, you guys, make sure you're following the show on Twitter. Really easy to do. Open up the Twitter app or go there on your browser. Find at HuddleUpPod. Click the follow button. That's a great way to support the show. It's a great way to keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening with the Huddle Up Podcast in real time. And then also a reminder, we're trying to get to 200 reviews on iTunes between now and the draft, which kicks off, of course, April 25th. So if you haven't taken the time to leave a brief review along with a five-star rating on iTunes, and you're listening through iTunes, please take some time, get that done. Zach and I would really appreciate it. You have no idea how much that can help the podcast, help us in terms of ratings, rankings, compete against other podcasts in our realm. So that's a, a big thing you can do to help the show between now and the draft is make sure you leave a creative review and rate the show, especially on iTunes. All right, Zach, so we had a few little pieces of uh, news that came out on Monday. Let's talk first and foremost about the fact that the Broncos are, in fact, signing DeMonte Thomas, the safety, and Elijah Wilkinson, who were, of course, uh, exclusive rights free agents. And those deals got done. It looks like for Wilkinson... 570, 570,000 is what he'll count against the cap, you know, assuming he makes the team this year, which I think he will. And then, of course, DeMonte Thomas at 645. So the Broncos are, uh, you know, tying up a few more loose ends. There were a few other ex- exclusive rights free agents that they tendered that have not yet been re signed, as far as I know. Yeah, Joseph Jones is, is among them. Tim Patrick is, is among them. But they're formalities, Chad. They will sign their tenders. Yeah. And what they amount to are, you know, they're one-year deals. They remain under Broncos control. And personally, I love Demonte Thomas. I know you're high on him, too, uh, to come back to the safety group. There should be a chance for him to carve out some playing time with no uh, permanent starter right now opposite Justin Simmons and Will Parks there. And uh, Elijah Wilkinson, he could be the starter at right guard uh, with Connor McGovern moving to center. So these were no-brainer moves by the Broncos. Uh, they were formalities. I'm glad to see both of them coming back. And it's about time they start restocking that cupboard with some young talent. I think DeMonte Thomas has a legitimate opportunity to start. Now, mm. I know that Will Parks, take alert. he's going to get the first rider refusal, right? They're going to give him the first probably open road to the starting position. We know Simmons is lock. He's a lock for starting job at free safety. And Will Parks, you know, the team's probably going to give him that first swing at the job. But DeMonte Thomas, man, he really picked up some momentum last year. And every time he was on the field, albeit it wasn't a lot as far as the regular season, but he acquitted himself well. He's a talented guy that I could really see thriving 
in Vic Fangio's system. Now, it's not any kind of bold prediction. I'm not saying DeMonte Thomas will win a starting job, but I think he has a legitimate chance to earn and be a dark horse guy to step in kind of, you know, out of left field and beat out a guy like Will Parks for a starting gig. Yeah, at the very least, though, he's going to be defending tight ends on third downs and passing situations and helping the Broncos on special teams. So they're already bringing back a two-way player. And under Vic Fangio, I mean, like I said, with everyone, if he thrives under Vance Joseph, I think he'll really ball out under uh, Vic Fangio and this defensive coordinator and the scheme being put in place. I don't know if he'll start, Chad. I think that's a little optimistic for him. I think Parks is the favorite, if only for now, but he will be in line for sure for heavy snaps, and he'll finally have a chance to carve out his role after having just kind of a bit role in the last couple of years. Yeah, definitely optimistic, no doubt about it. I mean, he's a he'd be a dark horse to win a starting job, but I I like his, his potential Agreed. for getting that done. And with Wilkinson, I mean, this time last year, we were talking about Elijah Wilkinson as an offensive tackle, right? And... He just kind of morphed into the inside. The Broncos ended up feeling like they could use him more on the interior once they actually got to play in the exhibition games in August. And he did pretty well when the Broncos finally had to turn to him. I think he started whatever was their final seven games at right guard. He did well. But we talked about on the show yesterday when we were breaking down the mock draft that right now it was one of the holes of that mock was that the Denver Broncos did not come out of my mock on Friday with a swing offensive tackle behind Bowles and Juwan James. And who knows, maybe Elijah Wilkinson, who at one point was an offensive tackle, the Broncos were playing him at offensive tackle, depending on what happens in the draft, depending on you know what happens, how the chips fall, so to speak, between now and training camp, maybe Elijah Wilkinson could fit that swing tackle mold for the Broncos when they finally get the cleats on the grass. Wilkinson reminds me a lot of Billy Turner in the sense that they're good, dependable, versatile guys. They can play all over the line, but I don't think they're they're starting material quite yet. You know, I don't think they're to that level. He's a good backup to have, but I don't think the Broncos starter at right guard is on the roster just yet. I think they're going to have an open competition with whoever they bring in in the draft. They have Sam Jones. They have Wilkinson, who showed pretty well, and they'll let M- Mike Munchak do his work, you know, make chicken salad out of that. I just don't think they're going to go into the season with Wilkinson ultimately as a starter, but as a backup, Chad, playing a tackle, playing a guard. I mean, you have Juwan James, who's had injury problems. You have Garrett Bowles, who's had struggle and, and, and uh, technique issues. So it's always good to have those guys. I just don't think he's a shoe in to start. I think that's a little uh, optimistic, uh, you know, with his uh, outlook. Yeah, and that's probably fair. And we can't forget either about Sam Jones, who was a sixth-round pick last year. And obviously the previous coaching regime loved Sam Jones. And the reason they loved him is because he just he really took to coaching and he kind of played with a nasty edge that, frankly, offensive line coaches just absolutely adore. So I think that the new coaching staff will like him too because if you go back and watch any of the tape, he appeared in two preseason games last season for the Broncos because he was, I think it was a back injury he was nursing for a couple of those games. But he did appear in two. He played center and he played some guard, mostly center though for the Broncos last year. Mm -hmm. And he just plays with a mean streak. You know, he plays, I was actually quite surprised because when the Broncos took him in the sixth round out of Arizona State, to me it felt like a, kind of a flyer move like it Mm -hmm. didn't really feel like it was a we have high expectations for this guy but he came in right out of the gates and played well and I could see him really making some noise under Mike Munchak which you know if we're trying to project what the starting five might look like I think the Broncos they're going to figure out some place to give Jones a chance to compete for a starting job and right now on the surface you know it looks like it'll probably be at least an opportunity to compete for right guard. Yeah, I'm with you on Jones. When they made that choice, I thought it was kind of a, I don't want to say wasted pick, but kind of a throwaway pick like you alluded to, staying with David Williams in the seventh round. I don't know what I want the Broncos to do, whether I want them to keep McGovern at right guard or move him to center. There's a lot of new moving parts here, but I know that when the Broncos drafted Sam Jones, they knew they had a project on their hands. They knew there was going to be a new coaching staff more than likely the next year. They didn't know they were going to get Mike Munchak, though, so that's a huge coup for Sam Jones' development, and I think he can be... Pushing to be a, an average starter in the NFL, maybe a couple years above average starter. He needs a lot of work, but fortunately, he has the best coach in the business at his disposal. And if they're looking for the best starting five and the best fits, I mean, the last thing I'll say about this, and then we'll move on, is it wouldn't surprise me, Zach, if they ended up kicking Jones inside to center and mm. put Connor McGovern yeah. back at right guard, depending, of course, on how the chips fall in the draft, because Sam Jones was drafted, or the, the front office's vision, obviously was to play him at center. 
and kind of he was kind of their fail safe against Matt Paradis leaving, but he wasn't ready last year. That's why McGovern had to step in and, and play center. This year, though, just like with Paradis, he took a year to marinate on the practice squad. I mean, he was cut. He was waived at the end of his rookie uh, training camp, fortunately re-signed to the practice squad. So he marinated on the on the practice squad through all of 2014. And then when Kubiak came in and he viewed the roster through these new eyes, his own blocking scheme, I mean, Paradis was a no-brainer, and he stepped in. And I think they had traded for Gino Gratkowski, if I recall right, um, and he beat the, the veteran out and won the job. And so it wouldn't surprise me to see Jones make that kind of a quantum leap forward to where the Broncos go, what are we doing? He's our center. We're going to put McGovern back at right guard. You know, that's a really good point. And if they don't come away in this draft with a surefire starter at center, like an Eric McCoy, like you picked in your mock, Chad, right. um, I would let uh, Sam Jones compete at the best spot where he, he fits in. Let him work at guard. Let him work at center. Wherever he fits better, play him there and then move the pieces around that. The Broncos showed last year they have no problem playing musical chairs, and they actually thrive better with that setup. So, you know, in terms of his development, he can play both, but I'm, I agree with you. I think he was drafted as a center. They need a center, and when they have Mike Munchak, I think they can have a starting one if he thrives in that role, though. That's the only thing that comes down to his development. By the way, did you see that tweet from Sarah Bettinger, our colleague over at Predominantly Orange? He tweeted back on March 13th. This is what he said real quick. This has absolutely nothing to do with our, our previous conversation, but this just occurred to me because I'm kind of rifling through Twitter while we're podcasting here. But Sayre tweeted back on March 13th, I could see John Dorsey doing his former team, the Chiefs, a favor and trading them Emmanuel Ogba. The Chiefs have nothing off the edge. And that went down on, on Monday, Zach. Yeah, that was, that was a pretty nice call. And I, I actually like that move for the Chiefs, Chad. I think they got a good uh, defensive player there. And they and they have Chris Jones in the interior. And they could have something there if they get one of the elite blue chippers in the draft. So that the Chiefs defense, they were a joke last year. But they can still be nothing to laugh at. And that kind of brings up another topic. While we are, you know, have Chiefs on the brain, so to speak, is the Broncos know who their 2019 opponents are going to be. And obviously each and every year, they're going to see their division foes twice, once at home, once on the road. We don't yet know what the order of the schedule is going to be. That's going to probably come out somewhere in the middle of the month. The NFL will release that, or maybe toward the end of the month. But by the end of April, we'll know. Do you have a preference, Zach, on what opponent you would like the Broncos to open the 2019 season mm. going against? Um, I would say a non-divisional opponent, someone fairly easy, and hopefully not the Browns. That's probably not going to happen. I, I'm not the Chiefs. I don't think it's going to be a primetime game. It's probably going to be a 1 o'clock game tucked away in the early window, or maybe because they always open up the season at home, a 4 p.m. opener. I don't have a preference. I just don't think it's going to be anyone major to start off the season, considering how they played last year. I hope it's the Chiefs, and uh-huh. here's why. And I don't even I hope, you know, my preference at that point would be at home, but the reason why is the Broncos played the Chiefs close in both matches. Now, they weren't quite as in the game in the, the away game at Arrowhead, but that still was a one-score game when it was all said and done. The Broncos should have beat the Chiefs in Week 4. We know, we've talked about it on the podcast multiple times. If Case Keenum doesn't wildly miss Demarius Thomas <laughs> streaking down the right sideline late in the game for the go-ahead score, which would have left no time for Mahomes, the Broncos win that game. So... I think, and with the improvements and upgrades they've made at different positions, including quarterback, um, the offensive line, cornerbacks going against Patrick Mahomes, and who knows, they might not even have Tyreek Hill to open the season. I would want to see the Broncos as kind of a litmus test, as kind of a measuring stick in terms of where are we compared to last year. I would not be opposed to the Broncos opening against Patrick Mahomes in the, as the defending AFC West champs in week one. Yeah, it, it's going to be a great series this year. The Broncos should put up way more of a fight, and you're right. They should have won that first game. I, I don't see it happening in the opener, but I do know that every year it seems like they play in prime time. So whether it's a Sunday night game, a Monday night game, I'm sure uh, Denver, Kansas City will be seen for everyone ar- around the country. All right, so we still do have a lot to get to, a couple topics we want to dive into before we get out of here today. But really quick, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. <laughs> All right, Zach. So again, as we touched on the Denver Broncos, most of our fans are are listening to this on Tuesday. So as you're listening, the Broncos are returning to 
the facility at Dove Valley today, if you're listening on Tuesday, to begin phase one of OTAs. And as we talked about in the first segment, it's mostly weight room. It's mostly classroom. They can't get out on the grass and and actually practice in this phase quite yet. So in that respect, though, Zach, these are voluntary workouts, right? And under the uh, collective bargaining agreement that was uh, executed back in 2011 after the lockout, that was one of the big things that the players union fought for is they wanted certain parts of the off season to be voluntary. Unfortunately for the players, it never really is voluntary, right? The team, even though it says voluntary, the team fully expects you to be there, whether you want to or not. So in that vein, what do we see in terms of players who don't show up across the NFL for those voluntary workouts? They're usually, of course, veterans and they're usually, well, they're always veterans at this stage, but um, they're usually veterans who have some kind of a bone to pick with the front office. So, or maybe guys who are coming off injury, but in that respect, Zach, who are some, do you see any potential Broncos who might not show up for this Mm. voluntary phase of OTAs? Anyone on your mind? Well, let me just preface this by saying that I, I, the Broncos need a solid sign of sh- uh, solidarity with a new head coach and, and a new culture and, and Vic Fangio installing his way. But two names come to mind. I know you have one too, Chad. Chris Harris Jr., who we agree on, who deserves a new contract, who wants a new contract, and who the Broncos aren't giving a new contract to just yet. I could see him staying away. He has nothing to gain by being there necessarily. Um, and Philip Lindsay, because he's coming off wrist surgery. Anyone coming off a major injury like Ronald Leary, Emmanuel Sanders, who also um, if he thinks he can be traded, Chad, if we know there's some chatter out there, he would stay away also to preserve that value. Those are the only players that come to mind. I know you have a couple too, though. Yeah, and the, Derek Wolf would be another one. And really, mm-hmm. for me, it, just, it comes down to guys who, I mean, the injured guys are kind of, it speaks for itself. And right. even Jake Butt, though, I, I think he plans on at least being at the facility. You know, he's going to be there. Coming off an injury, he'll be there nevertheless. But the guys who have a bone to pick, you know, if you're really putting on the tinfoil hat this time, uh, of year, it's Derek Wolf and it's Chris Harris. We've seen former champions on that Super Bowl 50 squad over the last three years. It's really been an exodus for the Broncos. And Derek Wolf, of course, and Chris Harris are two, of, along with Vaughn Miller, but they're two of the uh, of kind of the last guys who are key contributors on that defense that are still hanging out, and their future is in doubt as it relates to the Broncos. Now, we all want Chris Harris to remain a Bronco for life. I think everyone can agree on that. But when you start getting into the weeds of negotiations, you never know what's going to happen. And Chris Harris, I wouldn't blame him, Zach, if he chose to hold out. And the same goes for Derek Wolf. I wouldn't blame either of them if they said, you know what? Show me the love. Let me feel like I have a future here. And I'll be at the voluntary phase of OTAs. But I also would be disappointed if that happened because, as you said, as you hit on in your initial remarks... This is a key moment for the Broncos where they Mm -hmm. need a sign of solidarity and a show of force, and they need everyone on scene so that they can buy in officially to this new mantle that's being passed to Vic Fangio and start off on the right foot. And technically, Harris has nothing to gain by being there. You know, he knows he's going to be around. He knows he's the top corner. He knows how good he is. He knows how Vic Fangio wants to play him and move him around. So, you know, he has nothing to gain by showing up. He's going to absorb the defense. But he's a team player first and foremost, so I, I expect him to show up. I don't expect any major holdouts. I know Vaughn last year, he held up a training camp or a mini camp. I can't remember what it was, but that made some headlines. There's always going to be some surprise thing, but there's – it's a good vibe at a Dub Valley right now. There's no major bone of contention. And whether it's Chris Harris Jr. holding out or the Broncos not willing to give in, Elway has said he wants to wait till after the draft. And if Harris takes him at his word, it's on April 25th just yet. Yeah. They have some OTAs after that. They have a, a mandatory minicamp after that. If there's still contention there and, and a holdout there, then we have some problems. I think one of those guys should be – in the conversation for team captain, Wolf or Harris. Like you wrote the report on Monday, Von Miller talking about 100% taking that step forward in terms mm-hmm. of control as a leader and all that stuff. And that's great. But Von's more of a kind of a lead by example guy. Right. He's not at least, you know, I mean, we're not there every single day, but this is just what we know about Von. Compare him, for example, to DeMarcus Ware. DeMarcus Ware was not only a lead-by-example guy, but he was a get-down-in-the-trenches, let me show you how it's done, let me nurse you around, or, or, nurse you along, excuse me, and let's, you know, let me show you how this works in the NFL. And in that sense, 
you know, iron sharpens iron, just like Kubiak had on the shirts back in 2015, and it elevates the group. And then, of course, in-game, emotionally, you're keeping your guys focused, you're rallying them, all that stuff. And Von Miller, I think he does a good job. I have no complaints in terms of his leadership capabilities overall, but he's more of an example guy. He's a guy that says, look, just follow what I do and you'll be fine type deal. And I'm sure when something needs to be said in the huddle or he needs to light a fire, he has no compunction of doing so. But a guy like Derek Wolf or Chris Harris, but I'm going to talk more specifically about Derek Wolf. That's a guy who, you know, he does try to help his dudes and he's a guy they all respect. And in a weird way, even though he's a teammate, Zach, they fear him. And so, you know what, Derek Wolf, let him be one of the guys in which the other players have to have some sense of accountability to because he's a team captain. I think it could really help kind of, you know, slap some uh, plaster onto this group and bring them together even a little bit closer than they have been over the last couple of years. Yeah, you know, I'm with you on all counts, and, and Vaughn's not really the rah-rah type guy, and that's what I wrote in my story. He's not a get-in-your-face, a vocal guy. He's kind of a passive leader, and he's great at what he does. I have no complaints like you. I mean, he's one of the best of all time, but they need that fiery presence, and that's just not him. And um, Chris Harris Jr., to me, it's, it's they need to lock him down. They need to show some good faith. I've been saying this for months now, not to wait. He's one of the best corners in the game, a perennial all-pro one of the best undrafted finds in NFL history, reward them. Show some good faith, and um, I think it'll, it'll reward them ultimately down the line. And I'm with you. I, Vaughn made captain because of his resume. Let's not you know yep. kid ourselves here. And he probably will do that again under Fangio. But two guys more deserving based on morale and locker room presence. To me, I agree with you. Uh, Harris is my no-brainer, and Wolf is also in consideration. Yeah, and what he said in the quote, it was via Ryan O'Halloran from the Denver Post, he said, with regard to being a more active role as a leader in the locker room, he said, quote, 100%, with each year that passes, I get more and more confident with the leadership role. See, it's not his first, you know, it's not his, uh, it's not innate for him like it is for a guy like DeMarcus Ware, for example. I've shared a little bit, probably 20% to this guy and that guy, but I need to have 100% control of it to get this thing right now. Close quote. What he means by 100% control of it, I don't know if he means teaching, helping other guys along. I mean, obviously he's talking about leadership, but what exactly is he getting out there, you think, Zach? I think he means the the vocal part of it, what it means uh, stereotypically to be a leader, to be in your face and fired up and whipping towels and, and, and throwing you know water bottles around. Yeah. He's not that type. Like you said, instinctively, it's not him, and he wants to bring that out of himself. He tried last year coming out of his shell. Uh, he's kind of a shy guy off the field. He's not a big uh, party guy. It's going to be in TMZ a lot like Odell Beckham. He kind of stays behind the scenes, and he's trying to bring that out of himself, and it's it's not a one-year process. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll see what happens. I mean, I don't think either one of us are making any kind of bold prediction as to Chris Harris or Derek Wolf not showing up for OTAs tomorrow, but it wouldn't surprise either one of us if if they didn't, especially Harris, because he's been more in the public eye in terms of it being relentlessly asked to John Elway. I mean, it was asked at the end of the season. It was asked at the Combine. It was asked at free agency uh, when he was talking about Joe Flacco after that introduction and all that. So it's obviously very high profile, and Chris Harris has, you know, tweeted about it in a kind of passive-aggressive way since then. So it wouldn't surprise me, but uh, I don't think there's anything to worry about there, Broncos country. And here's one more question before we get out of here, Zach, that I want to volley your way. And this was... Something that kind of struck me on Monday as I'm going about my business and doing my thing, creating content and analyzing this thing like we do, is, you know, the mock draft, for example, that we talked about yesterday. Obviously, that's taking a quarterback right out of the gates at pick 10, and that's in a perfect world. But there's no, I mean, we, we're both pretty much in agreement that we'll be surprised if the Broncos do end up taking a quarterback at 10. We can't rule it out, but Elway's pretty clearly just trying to duplicate the model that he had with Peyton Manning and even more specifically the model of 2015 that helped, you know, that basically won a championship. And so in that sense, he wants to compete now. And if he thinks he can get a blue chip player at 10 that can contribute to winning now, he, that's probably what he's going to do instead of a guy that's going to be sitting on the sideline holding the clipboard for at least a year. So if that's the case, Zach, here's something to consider. So we've talked about, you know what, maybe we could live with if they take a Devin White or an Ed Oliver at pick 10, maybe we could live with a Jared Stidham uh, in round two or Brett Rippon later on or, you know, one of these guys later on in the draft. But something to consider is, and let me, let me pose it to you this way. 
Obviously, Kevin Hogan re-signed, so the Broncos have their fail-safe backup quarterback for Joe Flacco, notwithstanding whatever might happen in the draft. Do you see in that next group of quarterbacks, so let's take out, of course, Dwayne Haskins, Kyler Murray, let's take out Drew Locke, and maybe let's take out Daniel Jones. We'll take out the top four. Of that remaining crop or group of quarterbacks, do you think any one of them could step in from the moment his name gets called from the podium and be an upgrade over Kevin Hogan, who, let's not forget, this is a guy who is a former mid-round draft pick himself, and he does have starting experience in the NFL. I want to just say before I answer the question that we've you know, we've seen what Kevin Hogan can be in the NFL. We've seen his ceiling pretty much, and he is that of a, a number three quarterback at best. We haven't seen what a Will Greer could be, a Jared Siddham could be, a Brett, Brett Rippon could be, anyone can be. So I'd rather give a younger player that chance and, and then just roll with the guy because you had him last year. That's a great I thought. I also thought it, it was curious, though, they would bring him back this late in the process. I mean, he was a, a restricted free agent for a while, and they decided, oh, we'll bring him back on a one-year deal. Do they have a, a, a level of interest in him? But I don't see him as an upgrade over a guy that could potentially be a long-term backup, and you don't know what his potential could be. You don't know what his ceiling is. We've seen what Kevin Hogan is. We haven't seen the others. So that's that's pretty much why I you know, fall on that, on that and, side of the argument. Exactly. And that's what I, I agree with you. And that's where I'm at on that, too, because, you know, the devil's advocate take would be, look, if you don't see a quarterback after round one that can immediately come in and be an upgrade over Kevin Hogan, why waste a pick on a quarterback? And it's something we've kind of touched on earlier in a, from a different angle, but I agree with you because even if, for example, you don't necessarily believe that uh, Will Greer, just as an example, is an immediate upgrade over Kevin Hogan, Hogan as a quantity, he's known in terms of what his value is in the NFL. Mm -hmm. Whereas a guy like Will Greer, who, though he's very rough around the edges, he has some very tantalizing tools that are in the rough that have some real upside. You, I mean, he could come into the NFL – and there's there's that unknown, untapped element of Will Greer or some of the other quarterbacks too, including Brett Rippon and Jarrett Stidham. So I completely agree with you in that sense, Zach, that that doesn't mean just even if you can't guarantee or even if your evaluation is not necessarily that this player is an, is an immediate upgrade over Hogan, that doesn't mean you should not get, take that quarterback. I mean, you've got to find ways to improve the quarterback position because the last three seasons – I mean, this is the the Broncos are on their sixth quarterback in Joe Flacco, and you know we can all be optimistic. And as the listeners of this show know, I'm probably a little bit more bullish on on Flacco than Zach is, obviously. But there's no guarantee. I mean, he was he had a, he was off to a good start last year in in Baltimore, but the four seasons preceding that were not great for Joe Flacco. So there's absolutely zero guarantee that this model is going to work for Elway, which means at some point he's he might have to face facts. And, and turn to that young franchise caliber player with some upside to carry them, you know, to, to the next step in their development as, as the Denver Broncos still trying to recover from Super Bowl 50. I mean, put it this way. A couple of years ago, Elway used the last pick on the draft on some guy named Chad Kelly. Everyone booed that draft pick and hated it and thought it was a favor to Jim Kelly and a throwaway pick. Two years later, they were begging for him to be the starting quarterback. So you just never know what you're going to get in the draft. And to me, you know what you have in Kevin Hogan. But Will Greer, I'm with you. He has some. He reminds me of Kelly in that sense. He has that magic to him. He has those tools, you know, physically and yeah. his upside. Yeah. So I would rather the Broncos take a flyer on him in the third, fourth round, whatever, uh, and then just roll with Kevin Hogan because he was around last year. He he offers nothing to me as far as I'm concerned. Yep. He's, uh, you know, oh, crap, hold on to your you-know-what because he we have to play Kevin Hogan. Let's hold on for dear life. He's a hold on for dear life quarterback. He, you know, he's not he's not going to present you any kind of franchise upside. And he was a he was a good college quarterback at Stanford. I wouldn't say great, but he was a good quarterback in college. His play, he just doesn't have any of the tools, the physical gifts that can allow him to to, you know, excel at the next level in the NFL. He's solid, you know, and he is a fail safe, and that's how he'll continue that's probably how he'll always be viewed in the NFL as a Right now, he's a younger guy, but he's a younger guy with a, just enough experience and just enough of a wherewithal, Zach, that, you know, he's a failsafe. But if you have to turn to him for any significant stretch during a season, your curtains. 
You literally just stole it from my mouth. I was going to say, if he's your starting quarterback, it means your season's over. He's one of those guys, like a Mark Sanchez or a Colt McCoy. He's always going to be a a barely there number three quarterback in the NFL. And the Broncos can do a lot better than just settling on him after trading for Flacco. Well, hey, that's going to do it for today's episode of the Huddle Up Podcast. Zach and I will be back on Thursday with a fresh episode, and I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about because on Tuesday, the team is making certain players available. We'll have some quotes. We'll have some insights that come out of that. And also on Thursday, they'll be making the players available. So we'll have some stuff cooking and coming out of that to analyze for Thursday and Friday's show. But in the meantime, Building the Broncos will be back with an episode on Wednesday. So look forward to that. Also, make sure you're following the show on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod. You can find my partner, Zach Kelberman, on Twitter, at Kelberman247. Myself, at Chad N. Jensen. Don't forget to leave your creative review. Five-star rating on iTunes, you guys. It's absolutely crucial. Help us reach our goal of hitting 200 reviews on iTunes before the draft. We'll talk to you in a couple of days. For Zach Kelberman, I'm Chad Jensen. Talk to you soon. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.